Are we good to go? OK, thank you for coming to our presentation today. So before I begin, uh, can I have a quick show of hands? Who's running like a Linux server right now in production at their company? OK, and of those people that have a, their hand up, how many of you have your legal team concerned that the Linux kernel is GPL license? I'm sorry for you. <laughs> but for everyone else, right, GPL, uh, the Linux kernel being GPL licensed is just a normal part of what we're doing, right? And so by the end of this talk, I hope you'll also learn to stop worrying and love the GPL for eBPF-based programs too. So with that, let's begin with the most important part. We're not lawyers. This is not legal advice. This is a summary of intent. If you really want to get a extremely precise and expensive answer, go talk to your lawyer. Uh, your lawyer. Go talk to your lawyer. <laughs> this is a free conference talk. Yeah. Okay, so what's in this talk? So the first thing we're gonna walk through, the motivation, why is eBPF worth this GPL hassle? A quick overview of eBPF licensing considerations, reviewing the history of the relationship between CNCF and GPL licensing, and then providing you with a little bit of practical guidance about how you should think about GPL licensed eBPF programs in your application. So the motivation, it's no secret eBPF is eating the world, right? Why is that? So if you think about the Linux kernel, it's a 30-year-old technology. It doesn't innovate as fast as it used to. It needs to provide stability because it's running on billions of devices worldwide. And the Linux kernel is great because it provides a lot of performance and visibility into the system. It controls everything that's happening between the application and the hardware. But it kind of has lost that flexibility of adding new functionality on the fly as you need it. You can do things like kernel modules, but they can be difficult to use, unsafe, and can crash your kernel, and may not always be stable. And how can we kind of bring this programmability into the kernel, and how does this benefit a cloud-native environment? Right? So this is what eBPF is. It's bringing that flexibility and programmability into the Linux kernel to allow us to provide new functionality to meet the demands of the cloud-native world in terms of scalability, performance, uh, complexity. It's a safe, performant, uh, uh, and observable way to instrument the Linux kernel. And the great thing is it's available by, def by default in most modern Linux uh, distributions. So it provides a lot of benefits, but we're not here to kind of um, talk about that. Um, so the kind of like history in the old days, it could take you five years to get something from a user demand about what you kind of need in your Linux kernel to it actually being available in production, right? This is a very long cycle. So instead with eBPF, we can now do that in a couple of days. And this drastically reduces the innovation cycle and what we can add an instrument into uh, we need to provide uh, for our applications. And in the word of Brendan Greggs, this kind of gives superpowers to the Linux kernel. And I guess another way to think about this in the cloud native world, right? So you have your smartphone, and originally it was just shipped with uh, the applications that the that the uh, device provider gave you. But with the iPhone and the App Store, suddenly you could download new functionality onto your phone on the fly and have something like an application to guide you around a new city or a way to buy metro tickets or call, call a taxi, right? That's new functionality that you needed and were able to download it. eBPF allows you to do something similar. You're able to add new functionality to a device you already have on the fly, and that's pretty powerful. So, you now know why eBPF is great, but what do you have to actually provide when um, you're gonna put eBPF in your project? Um, I'm gonna go over, there's a lot in the slide, but I'm gonna break it up into, th into three pieces, right? So the first thing you have to do is provide eBPF bytecode that needs to be loaded into the kernel. This is uh, what ends up practically needing to interact with GPL code, so you have to be careful there, um, and it's going to, um, optionally interact with a user space application that you provide. This is normally what you do in a project. You'll have a user space application and a BUPF bytecode. So, and this is the thing that usually does all your business logic and will interact um, via maps uh, with the kernel. And it's usually run privileged. 
usually there's an asterisk there. There are some short, small use cases where you don't have to run as a privileged application. But the Linux kernel provides a whole bunch of stuff for you already, right? Um, there's a syscall API that you interact with, so you can actually load the eBPF programs and load the maps that they use to exchange data with the user space. Uh, there's also um, a just-in-time compiler um, and a verifier and a virtual machine. All of this is inside the kernel space. So, um, and this is uh, sort of the real magic is all of those components that you don't have to provide. You just have to load your bytecode into the kernel function. So here's a really simplified uh, life cycle uh, for what an eBPF program will look like, um, very high level, uh, right? So you start out in user space and you compile your usually C or Rust, um, though I guess we have Go now, right? So um, into uh, eBPF bytecode, um, then you basically uh, use the syscall APIs and you load that bytecode into kernel space for, for the verifier to take over. Uh, your application then does whatever other business logic it needs. Uh, and before I get to maps, now in a modern uh, program or user space program, we actually uh, use libbpf. You can actually wrap those two pieces together into an application and the application will then load the bytecode for you, right? You don't have to do it as separate steps. Modern applications will do that um, as part of normal startup. So if you flip over to the kernel space, you know, once you've loaded the bytecode via the API, uh, it'll verify that it's safe to run and it's possible to run. Uh, it'll attach it to the correct um, kernel event hooks. So your, you know, whether it's networking or or file system layer, uh, whatever the eBPF program is supposed to be uh, in line and executing on, and then it becomes an event-driven uh, executable, right? So it's not async, it's not running parallel on some sort of thread as, as event data or as kernel data flows through the kernel. Uh, it'll use these hook points and basically activate these eBPF programs at that point, which is why it makes it super efficient. But the big thing that I want to come back to at the very end of this is that the kernel space and the user space side are interacting via these eBPF maps via the syscall API. And this is how you communicate back and forth so you're able to get observability data out of the kernel or you're able to reconfigure eBPF programs to take different actions. So now that we know why we want to use eBPF and a little bit about what it was, uh, let's dive into the licensing overview. Why are we even talking about GPL if it's so scary for so many people? So eBPF has its origins in the Linux kernel and a lot of what we're gonna be talking about is licensing concerns working specifically with the Linux kernel implementation of this. And because the Linux kernel is GPL2 license, we're gonna to have to talk about how that affects the way that eBPF programs are licensed. So the big question is, do eBPF programs need to be GPL licensed? Well, like any good lawyer would say, uh, it depends. We have a few more billable hours that we need this month. So when eBPF bytecode is loaded by the Linux kernel, it's gonna check if it's using any of the helper functions that are marked as GPL only and see if the, EB, the licensing of the eBPF program is compatible with uh, the GPL. If it's not and doesn't have that licensing, then the kernel will reject that eBPF program because it's not, doesn't have a compatible license. And not all eBPF helper functions are GPL only. However, as uh, Alexi would say, he's one of the co-founders and co-maintainers of eBPF, that all meaningful BPF programs are GPL licensed. So the practical answer at the end of this is yes, eBPF programs need to be GPL licensed. And one example to kind of show why the practical answer is yes is talking about this uh, helper function to generate log outputs. So if you have a non-GPL licensed eBPF program but you want to add this in for debugging purposes, you actually need to change the license to be able to get the um, kernel to accept the program. And that's why it's pretty highly impractical to avoid licensing eBPF bytecode not as GPL. And so as you're thinking about adding eBPF into your project, you should think about how GPL licensing fits into that overall. 
And so, as Bill just said, the, the kernel actually has a very specific uh, set of function calls um, where you uh, tell the kernel which license you're about to upload in terms of your eBPF program. So you write an eBPF program, program, you have to basically mark it as saying, this is licensed a certain way, separate from the other licensing auditing you're doing. Uh, this is actually a, a, a call you make to tell the, the kernel runtime or the eBPF verifier um, that it's acceptable to use uh, certain helper functions, right? And it's a different, this is a different nomenclature than what you'll see in the header files. Um, so it comes down to what, is, what does the kernel um, want you to choose or what, what is available. There's actually a list in the, in the kernel licensing documentation about acceptable licenses. Uh, generally, uh, the, you know, you're going to want to pick a dual license. You can do GPL2, but it's, it's uh, generally, especially in CNCF, um, I think you'll want to choose a dual license here. What matters is, is that it's GPL compatible at runtime when the, when the UPF program loads into the kernel. But CNCF doesn't actually allow GPL as a, as a, a license under its IP policy. So programs have had to, uh, or, or I should say uh, CNCF projects that have used the UPF have had to uh, ask for an exception. And that makes it difficult historically to basically uh, add UPF and get it through the process. But before we talk about that, about there's been some recent changes there, uh, I want to finish up just talking about the other licensing issues you may have run into in discussion. Uh, the, other, the other issue, other than the UPF side, is can the, what do you have to do with the user space executables that are interacting with these UPF programs? And, you know, the truest answer is it's complicated. Contact your lawyer. But uh, the documented intent from the Linux uh, kernel developers is that this should be sort of a normal, reasonable practice because everything in the user space here is using the Linux uh, syscall API, which has a very specific carve out as an exception um, so that it's treated as user space and not part of the kernel. There are a lot of terms associated with licensing and before I go any deeper, I think it's important to sort of reflect on what these terms are, especially in the GPL licensing, right? What, what are we really interacting with here? What are, the, what are the terminology? So one of the big issues is, you know, is eBPF programs uh, derived works of the kernel, right? And that's, uh, that's sort of why they have to be considered GPL licensed. And on, if you think about kernel modules, they absolutely are, right? Because you're interacting with with uh, a very specific uh, Linux kernel. You have to link against uh, a specific version. Uh, whereas eBPF programs, um, it is a little more complicated, um, but the compiled bytecode, even if it's separate sources, the compiled bytecode, because it's interacting with the Linux kernel and using functions, is considered a derived work, um, generally. Or at least that's the intent. Again, we're not lawyers. Um, and then the other issue is whether or not when you decide to take your bytecode and your application code at the same time and package them together, is that a modular program or is it an aggregate? And the documented intent um, is that they should be treated as aggregates when it's eBPF because the eBPF program is uh, using the syscall API. Uh, and, and, and the thing with aggregates is if you have two programs, even if they're interacting, right? Um, if they're using provided um, normal mechanisms by the OS, uh, normally you would see like if your shell, if you're interacting via pipe or file descriptors, the, the Linux syscall API is meant to be similar to that where you're able to interact across the syscall and it's considered separate programs from that point on. So even though you've developed them together and they're intended to interact, they are considered an aggregate when you package them and you're able to load bytecode from the application. Um, and like I said, this all, this all comes out of the intent around the Linux syscall API uh, license exception note. I think the Linux kernel developers have done a really good job to document the intent here. Uh, they actually provide this uh, syscall note on all, the, on all the header files 
uh, that make up uh, the syscall API so that you can, you can be um, clear about their intent as to where the boundary is between user space and, and Linux, um, the kernel itself. So just a, a little diagram about why I'm talking about, like when I'm in a modern eBPF uh, user space application, you'll bundle that bytecode that you compiled as just a, just a data blob, right? And then you use, you use the Linux syscall APIs to load that across the boundary. And this is why it's considered an aggregate because we're using that syscall boundary instead of just loading it into memory inside user space as sort of two highly connected functions or applications. Um, and this is, uh, this is the reference from why I say uh, um, the, there's clearly defined intent here from the Linux kernels um, developer side. There's actually uh, some documentation uh, that specifically says that generally they expect to be able to uh, have user space uh, programs, proprietary license, then interact with eBPF programs. And this is, again, about the intent that has been uh, documented. The other remaining question here about aggregates uh, versus modular is eBPF maps. Uh, if two programs share memory uh, that's highly um, detailed or, or, or between the two applications, like you have to know the internals of the memory, you may have to consider that as a modular program. And so, so a question can come up about whether maps are these sort of structures. And again, it's complicated, contact a lawyer. But the practical answer is because these maps are being uploaded and, and interfaced via the syscall, it is uh, practically speaking um, meant to be considered as an, the intent is to consider these as functions that an aggregate can take advantage of. Um, and as a great example, the BPF tool, which is used by everybody as a diagnostic to see what maps are doing, right? independently developed has access to all the maps that all the other programs are running on the system. So you aren't so intimately tied, to, even though you're providing the map as part of spin up um, when your application is loading their bytecode, BPF tool can actually access that, right? And you can get information diagnostically from it. Uh, one word about that though is you should think about documenting your maps. A lot of the map types are sort of self type because they're simple, they're defined by the Linux kernel uh, side, right? But there are a couple of types that are very flexible, uh, which can appear as sort of a blob of data. You can't really peer into them diagnostically. There's actually a solution here. Uh, if, you're, if you're already writing a modern um, compile once, run everywhere uh, BBPF program, you're already sort of getting documentation of these types for free automatically because there's a thing called um, the BPF type format. And to make core work, you have to implement that. And then once you have, once you have used that, BPF tool can see inside your, your nested structs and actually give you diagnostic information. So it's, important, it's an important thing to do from an intent standpoint because you want your own users who need to diagnose these things be able to look into these maps. So a real quick licensing re recap after all of this, you know, user space effectively, practically um, can be licensed however you want. If you're a CNCF program um, project, that's not true. Uh, you have to still buy by the CNCF uh, policy and, and pick a license that CNCF is okay with. Um, and then the, for the bytecode side, for the eBPF bytecode side, generally you're gonna wanna choose to do dual license with the GPL. Uh, with some other permissive um, open source license. And for CNCF projects, that has been an exception to the rule. So let's talk about that now. So CNCF and the GPL has, as Jeff has been hinting to, been in an exceptional relationship. So it's kind of interesting, right? The, the CNCF is a sub foundation of the Linux Foundation, which obviously hosts the Linux kernel. Um, and obviously the Linux Foundation likes or supports the GPL. However, CNCF as being a sub-foundation has its own separate IP policy. 
And the key one here is all outbound code will be made available under the Apache license version two. So that's what Jeff was talking about, all the user space applications for CNCF projects have to be Apache 2.0. However, like in this IP policy, they can also ask for exemptions from the governing board. So using eBPF in a CNCF project has historically been complicated because the GPL is not specifically allowed within the CNCF's IP policy. However, that's not really going to work, and the governing board saw that. There's really no stopping eBPF in cloud native. There's Cilium, Falco, Blixt, Istio, Pixie, Inspector Gadget, and even Kubernetes are using eBPF right now. A lot more projects are considering it, and I wouldn't be surprised if almost every single project on the CNCF landscape was using eBPF in some way in the future. So to really take advantage of eBPF, we need to reconsider how we think about the licensing considerations. And the big news here, uh, as Jeff has been hinting to, there's actually recently a blanket eBPF licensing exception approved by the governing board. So it's great news. And essentially saying that the CNCF allows uh, projects to have eBPF uh, uh, a bytecode licensed as GPL uh, 2.0 or later. And this is great news because now we can have eBPF programs in CNCF projects. So that's the state of the licensing, but you still have to do some things in your project to, so that you can simplify this uh, and make sure that you manifest the state and intent that uh, we've been discussing. So the first thing, these are my personal opinions. These are, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, this is not legal advice. Um, this isn't even my employer's opinions, nor is it Bill's opinions. These are mine. Sorry, Bill. So, so we can use uh, Cilium as a guide here, uh, as a project that's basically doing some things that uh, the CNCF has already looked over as sort of okay practice, even before the exception. Um, so uh, the first things you should probably think about doing um, is you wanna make sure the eBPF uh, source code that's gonna have to be uh, GBPL compatible is compartmentalized in your project a little bit. You can, it doesn't have to be its own repo, it can be a subtree, but it needs to sort of hang together um, and be obvious, right, to everybody who's looking that this is the part, portion of the code that will make up uh, or be compiled into uh, BBPF bytecode. Um, I think you should probably uh, choose uh, a dual license instead of just GPL uh, by itself for reasons that sort of future-proofing a little bit. Um, and you want to make sure that, you know, this complies with the intent that um, associated with uh, the documentation around the EBPF. Um, one thing you'll also have to watch out for is that the mechanism that I spoke of, how the, you tell the Linux kernel it's GPL, it's different than your license audit mechanism, right? At the, at the file level, you'll, you'll need to have the uh, SPDX license headers, right? Which is a different terminology than what you see um, inside the function call that the kernel requires. So make sure and keep up with that, that you don't have drift there, you don't accidentally put um, the, 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 the wrong uh, or incompatible nomenclature, right, between the, the license header at the top of the file and what you actually uh, say to the Linux kernel. It's a, it, can, it can drift, and, and so you have to watch out for that. So going above and beyond that, um, again, my personal opinion, uh, do what you can to document those maps, that you should think about the maps as being, an, uh, as being a user space facing interface, which means that you should think about it as a, an API that you document, right? And, and I don't probably, there's probably not a single project that does it 100% uh, to the extent that I would like to see it, but the BTF uh, format, gets us really close, like to the point where you can actually debug these, these, um, these complicated map structures that applications are using from user space, which practically speaking is like a big benefit to everybody, even, even developers that when they're interacting with their own users, right? Uh, being able to debug these things. So, and I, I sort of feel like there's an opportunity here to go a little further, like maybe we can get some more automated tooling and do 
uh, better sort of generated documentation. But that's sort of a future concern. So what are the future concerns? If all the things that we told you right now had to be thrown out the window, where does that leave us? As I said before, uh, eBPF came from the Linux kernel, but it's not the only place you can implement it. Um, it's possible to implement eBPF for other operating systems, for things meant for IT microcontrollers or Windows. eBPF for Windows is a project on GitHub right now. You can go check it out. And eBPF is coming to other types of operating systems. So because these other operating systems may not uh, be GPL uh, licensed, that means that the eBPF programs may not need to be GPL licensed either. Some of these implementations for maybe edge computing or running Windows nodes on Kubernetes are going to be relevant to CNCF projects. I guess one open question to take away from this is, like, can CNCF get ahead of Windows eBPF licensing requirements before they start showing up as uh, requests from projects? Because we want to keep... We don't want to go through this again. We don't want to go through this again. Yeah. Short story. So uh, that's the end, and we're just going to kind of wrap up here. Um, if you want to learn more about eBPF, uh, I recommend checking eBPF.io. Um, it is also available in multiple languages, including uh, French, Italian, and Portuguese. We're also looking for people to help translate it into more languages to bring eBPF to uh, other regions. I know there's currently translations in process for Italian, Swahili, uh, Chi and Chinese. So if you're another language, uh, please talk to me after uh, this talk. And last thing, shameless self-promotion. Um, I just released the book. I haven't even seen it yet because it arrived <laughs> at the shipping dock at 10.30 this morning. Uh, the book, Buzzing Across Space, The Illustrated Children's Guide to eBPF. Um, I'll be signing at 1.30 at the Cilium Experience Center. If you want to see it at the same time I do for the first time, uh, then, <laughs> then come by. So with that, thank you for coming. And unfortunately, we do have a little bit of time for questions, and we're not lawyers. So. <laughs>